Um, those of you who don't know me, my name is Fahim Salam. Uh, I'll be talking to you as president of the Cardiology Research Club. Um, this was a club formed maybe two years ago, 2019, became super active last year, thanks to Abdullah, thanks to Mark, thanks to Al Shafi. Um, current members, um, Al Shafi down, it's all alphabetical. I don't have anything against Yasser or C1. Um, thankfully, they're not here, at least Yasser isn't. Um, this is an open invite to anyone interested in cardiology, anyone not interested in cardiology as a fellowship, but just wants to learn, wants to know, is curious, you're more than welcome to join. Um, we, we, we have some fun sometimes. Right, so what did we achieve all of last year? We have more than 15 PubMed index articles. I made sure to include one which has my name on it. Um, about 25 accepted abstracts. This is four of us um, presenting at some point last year. Of course, the numbers can be better. There is a reason why it doesn't say the number of awards. That's something we'll, we'll work on together as well, sorry, um, in the coming year. So aims and objectives, research, right? It's a cardiology research club. We're gonna work on research. Um, we'll help, we'll teach you. Uh, we'll help you get in, involved in research, get your name on stuff, whether it's meta-analyses, um, case reports, um, abstracts, oral poster presentations. And the next thing is awards, of course. Um, I think one thing that we were lacking last year, especially, you know, when I show you this, um, where it go? Yeah, when the screenshot, we're not getting enough practice before we're actually presenting. And that's gonna be something we work on. Hopefully we can work on it with all of you involved, like classic Thursday um, didactics, not just the cardio research lab, but we'll work about, we'll talk about that later on. Um, so yeah, practice, oral presentations, practice, poster presentations, how to make them, how to present them. And hopefully we can have a better kind of uh, outcome with our awards. Education as well. Um, I know we're called Cardiology Research Club, but I want you to think of it as a cardiology interest group or something like that, right? This isn't just for research. This is for education. This is for motivation, mentorship, to develop interest in you. Because regardless of what field you're going into, you know, heme onc, pulmonology, critical care, whatever it is, you're going to you're gonna end up looking at EKGs. You're going to end up looking at ejection fractions of 35%. You, you, you would want to know what you're talking about. You would want to know what you're looking at, essentially. Um, hopefully we can achieve all of these aims in the next academic or in this academic year. That is all about us. If you wanna be a part of this group, if you wanna be part of the premier research club in this program, email me, WhatsApp me, text me, talk to me in, um, in real life. I'll add you to the group, we'll figure it out, we'll help you out. Anyway, um, so basics of EKG is what we're gonna talk about. Um, I'd like to keep it interactive. I have all of your faces in front of me. So um, I'll be picking on the interns a lot, but maybe some second years, third years can help out as well. Anyway, so the first thing about EKGs is where do you put the electrodes, right? You don't want to be reading EKGs, treating everything. You don't even know. You don't even know where to put the the sticky things on. So easy to remember, right? Right arm, left arm, right leg, lower, left leg, all four extremities. Then you go with. You start with V1 and V2, fourth intercostal space, either side of the sternum. V4 is going to be where your apical impulse essentially is, right? Fifth intercostal space, midclavicular line. V3 is going to be in the middle. That's essentially what the description is. V5 is going to be anterior auxiliary line. V6 is going to be mid auxiliary line. You're probably not going to have to ever do this, but I think it's worth worthwhile to know, right? So you have the you have the sticky things on. You have the electrodes on. Sorry. What are you seeing, right? So EKGs we're doing to look at electrical activity. We're not gonna be talking about mechanical activity, contractions and all, that's not gonna be a part of what we're talking about. So the first thing, the sinoatrial node, pacemaker cell, it's gonna depolarize, it's gonna bring a P wave in, right? 
Electrical activity is going to go into the AV node. AV node is going to block everything. You're going to see nothing on the EKG. Hopefully, you're going to see nothing on the EKG on a healthy patient. Um, the impulse is going to go into the His Purkinje system, into the bundle branches, depolarize the ventricle. You're going to see QRS. We'll talk about it. You know why does it, you know, go up, go down? We'll talk about it um, later on. ST, your ventricle is depolarize, it's in the refractory state, you're not gonna see anything, your atrium has repolarized during the QRS complex. Um, and then ventricular repolarization begins, um, as you can see in the arrows, you'll see a T wave, and then you're at rest. Got it. All right, any questions about the conduction cycle? Right. Step-by-step -step approach to EKGs, rate, rhythm, intervals, access, and then repeat. That's all it's gonna be. It's about practice. It's about looking at as many EKGs as you can, try to figure out what's happening, ask around, um, practice makes perfect, I guess. Um, we're gonna look at a bunch of EKGs. I want, um, actually, I don't want volunteers. I'll ask um, one of you to kind of read it. We're not gonna diagnose them. We're just gonna practice reading or saying what we see. Right, so the first few, we're only gonna talk about rate and rhythm, right? So Naveed, you're the first one on my screen. Can you, can you tell me what the rate is on this EKG? So for this EKG, So about, I would say about 120. 120, okay. And yeah. how did you, how did you come to it? Like so what's there, your... Uh -huh. So basically there are 20 spikes, QRS complexes, uh, times six. So 120. Absolutely, right? So the concept where Naveed um, came to it or actually it's spiked, oh, what's the rhythm do you think? Rhythm is... Never mind the diagnosis, is it regular or irregular? Is regular. Perfect, right? So rate of 120, regular rhythm. We're not gonna go into whether it's sinus or whatever. We'll, we'll get to that later on, right? So next on my screen is Surya. Um, what do you think the rate and rhythm is here? rate is like a little bit higher than 150 like uh, that's fine um how are you coming what's the thought process what are you looking at exactly i counted the number of qrs complexes in lead two and i multiplied okay. by six it's like 27 times six my math is not that good um, that's fine it'll come out to 162 i think so yeah. the important part is especially when you know when you're looking at um, what you call it, when you're looking at regular rhythm, it's easy yeah. to do what we are taught to do. Sometimes you know you look at the big boxes, you divide it by three hundred, so three hundred, one fifty, a hundred, somewhere in between. It's about it's one twenty, as um, um, Naveed mentioned. When it's irregular, just to make the point, if you do it. Um, for these two QRSs, it's going to come out to something like 150. You do it for these, it's going to come out 180. That's fine. You know, you know, a patient is in RVR. But if you do it for these two, this patient would probably be in the early 100s or even 90s, right? So in the rhythm is irregular. Well, I gave you the answer, but the rhythm is irregular. Whenever it's irregular, go with um, what Surya and Naveed did, count the number of QRSs, multiply it by six. That number comes from the fact every small box is going to be 0.04, every five boxes is going to be 0.2, so every five of these bigger ones is going to be one second. 
you count all of these, it turns out to be 10 seconds, right? Beats per minute, 60 beats a minute, uh, sorry, 60 seconds, you know what you have in 10 seconds, multiply by six, you'll have your heart rate. Um, right. Who is next? Isosa, what's the rate and rhythm here? So the rate is um, 42 bits per minute. Mm -hmm. Then the um, rhythm is not regular, it's irregular. It's irregular, yeah. Rhythm being the, between RR complexes, mm -hmm. there's a difference in number of um, small boxes, the number of um, big boxes between them. Yeah, I mean, ideally so, you'd so have- you'd have, have, Yeah, ideally you'd have calipers, you'll, you know, kind of, March it out, you'll have, you can, can have some a, radiation. Is it possible to get a recheck right now? What's that? Thank you. Yeah, point, yeah, point of curiosity. Oh, never mind. So ideally you'll have calipers, you can kind of march out the QRSs, you can march out what we see as the P, can be regular, can be irregular. Um, some ir ir irregularity can come in sinus bradycardia from respirations. But as you said, Rate is 42, you need calipers or something to kind of figure out the regularity of the um, of the rhythm. Um, did I miss the slide? All right, so we're gonna kick it up a notch. Who's next? Amira. So rate, rhythm, as well as we're gonna add diagnosis to it. So the rate is like 72, about, and then I guess, and the rhythm is regular, looks pretty regular. Yeah. There's P's before every Q's, Q's before every P's. I would say this is like normal sinus rhythm. Yep, it is normal sinus rhythm. So you talked about rate, you talked about rhythm, you talked about P waves preceding every QRS. There are a couple, there are a few other things that you need to kind of figure out for um, what you might call it um, sinus rhythm criteria. So one is it's gonna it's it's gonna have to be positive and leads one to an AVM, right? Um, we'll talk about we'll talk about why eventually when we're talking about axes. So you know same thought process you look at the rate at 72 you look at the rhythm it looks um regular you look at the p waves you can see it before each qrs then you go to the next um steps that we talked about what's the morphology of the p right it's before every qrs it's positive positive looks the same um same in lead one i know it's messy but you can see it's positive and the same in avf right the morphology of the P doesn't change with time. Then you look at PRs, right? So what's the normal, actually we'll come back to this later on. Normal PR is going to be between 0.12 and um, 0.2 seconds. You can see 0.2 is gonna be one big box. So it's, this is probably around 0 0.16, 0 0.18. So you're happy about that. And the next QRS, it's, within two small boxes, you want it to be less than three small boxes, less than 0.12 essentially. So that's gonna be the criteria. I mean, you could probably tell it's normal sinus without having to do all of those steps, but it's always good to get into the practice, which we talked about rate, rhythm, intervals, um, access, and then of course. So let's practice P. And Fahad, real question, if you go back to the EKG, <laughs> How do we know it's proper lead placement? How do we know it's proper lead placement if it's um, if the axis doesn't make sense, right? So 
The so quick way to do it would be to look at AVR and the P wave has to always be downwards. That's a quick and easy. So if you're ever, you know, questioning whether or not leads are misplaced on an EKG, this would be a quick way. Got it. Thank you. Um, yeah, so let's practice P waves and P wave morphologies. Next on my screen is Samreen. Do you want to take this one? So for this one, we'll only do rate, rhythm, P waves, and diagnosis if you want. I don't think Samreen heard you. You want me to go or no? Um, I think she's sure. counting. I Looks think like she's, she's counting. counting. Yeah, she's oh, counting. Counting. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Uh, so the uh, rate is around 75. The rhythm is regular. The P wave is completed by QRS. Uh, uh, left axis and there's ST elevation in V1 to V3. Um, what else? Yep. And the What about the P waves? Um, so the P waves are negative. Negative or bifurcate? I'm not sure. It look like biphasic. Um, it look like negatives, negative P waves in lead two. Le right. ne yep. So negative P waves, the morphology doesn't change too much as no. we kind of trace them. Let's, huh? Yes, same morphology. Exactly. So let's ignore the V1 to V3 SDs. Let's talk about regular rhythm, negative P wave, right? We were talking about sinus rhythm criteria on the previous mm -hmm. one. But here we don't have it positive and lead to um, and one is positive and if uh, yeah. AVF is negative. So yeah. what would be the... Sorry, can you say that again? Yes, both negative. The P waves are negative in AVF and lead to. Right. So essentially what's happening is if the current is going from the SA node to the AV node in this direction, you should see a positive spike in lead two, but we're not seeing that, right? We're gonna come back to this again when we're talking about axes, but essentially that's why it becomes important to look at the P wave morphologies. If it's not meeting that criteria, we can't call it sinus. The answer is it's ectopic atrial rhythm, but just to stress on the importance of um, looking at the P waves, the morphologies and all of that. Yeah. Mm. All right, next one. Um, I don't know, you guys got, oh, Mackie's here. Mackie, you can do it. Okay, so. So the rate here is about, it's over 170, over 180. Um, it looks irregular. Yeah, it's irregular. So the rate is about 180. It's irregular. P wave. Um, the more changes I can see but the morphology changes it's um it's upright um and then down trending in some leads that's what i'm saying yep so you see one morphology here you see one morphology here you see a third morphology here um maybe there's more so you have irregular rhythm um you could have said you know afib or whatnot but yeah. when we focus on the P waves, you see three different P waves. So what would you call a tachycardia with, you know, kind of changing morphologies of P waves? Uh, I think that would be flutter, right? Um, 
something else. So flutter, you would see flutter waves. Multiple so together, right? Uh -huh. Yes, multiple atrial tachycardia. Multiple. Multifocal atrial tachycardia. For a flutter, um, you see this negative kind of flutter wave. Flutter is going to be in the rates of 300. The atrial rate is going to be around 300. So you'll see a negative here. You'll see a negative here. You'll see a negative here. The morphology to, shouldn't change as such. But I get what you're... I get what you're thinking. Um, right. All right, so next thing we're gonna talk about is gonna be PR intervals. Um, intervals are always gonna be the start of the first letter to the end of the second letter. So PR is gonna be start of P to um, end of R, right? Um, same with ST, uh, same with QT. ST is a segment. Anyway, so I don't, I think we're out of interns. So let's go with second years. Isa, you're the first one. Yep. So um, going over, first of all, the rate uh, looks like 100, 150, around like 100 ish, maybe 100. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, something like that. Um, regular one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. It's almost regular rhythm, mm -hmm. um, but the up, 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 P wave looks like P wave after, uh, before each QRS, uh, positive in one, two, AVF. The thing mm -hmm. is, the PR interval is more than almost a box, so that's uh, prolonged. And uh, if you look at lead two, it's uh, persistently prolonged the same period each time. There is no dropped QRSs, so this would be a first degree block. Perfect, perfect. So go to the steps, rate, rhythm, um, P wave morphologies, and then you go to intervals, you see PR is prolonged. You don't have any missed beats. You don't have any prolongation. First degree high block, perfect. Um, Rohan, what do you think is happening here? Um, so rate two. Twelve, so sixty, seventy-two. Um, looks like obviously some dropped, but p p longer, p longer, p longer. Looks like uh, Mobits type two. Type one, right? Thank you back. Yeah, type one. Sorry. Yep. So essentially, what Rohan is talking about PR interval. Prolongs pretty obviously, pretty obviously. And then you see a P, it's not followed by QRS. If this was sinus, you would see a QRS here. So Venki back, classic. Let's just, just start thinking about, you know, PRs, start thinking about um, drop beats. Why, why are they dropping? What's the diagnosis? Um, next one is Mahmoud. Okay, is it the same EKG? Uh, it's different. I'm trying to remove all of this um, that I drew. I will figure it out. Oh, there you go. Okay. So for the rate first, it's gonna be you. It's around, I guess, uh, 100. Uh, it's irregular, as we can see. So for the P waves, we can see there's one, one, one here, one here, and all of a sudden there is QRS drop. So it's Mobitz type two. Two people here. Yep, Mobitz type two, right? So PR stays the same, stays the same. Out of nowhere, you miss a QRS goes back to being the same, being the same, being the same, and then you miss it again. Move it's type two, um, classic kind of a picture. Um, 
who is next? Um, Nabil. Are you mute? Yeah. No, 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 Nabil Malik. Okay, so this is um, so we're gonna look at the okay. So I'm I'm already seeing that there's oh but sorry. Well, I'm already seeing that since we dropped beats um, and then so or just very bradycardic. Um, so let me get a normal looking rhythm. Uh, so, yeah, so looking at B6, um, there seems to be, uh, looking at lead two, um, there seems to be dropped beats, uh, and I'm just, I'm trying to pair it together to see if it's either, um, if it, if it increases, if the PR interval increases and it drops, or if it remains long and it drops, um, so that one's elongated, and it, one, two, uh, that's a dropped one. That's a dropped one. Uh, dropped one. Um, so one, two, three. One, two, three. Uh, one, two, three. One, two, three. Um, so I think this is probably type one mobits. Type one mobits, right? So I'm gonna move, you, you see this marker, right? On your screen, this one. So where's the first QRS that you see on this strip? Uh, here, well, I guess you can't see where I'm gesturing to, but uh, right. yeah, here, yeah. That's right. So this is the QRS morphology. Mm -hmm. You can kind of track it out. It's fairly regular, right? Okay. Where's your P wave? Mm -hmm. So what the options we're left with are this, 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 or this. Which one do you think? A, B, C, or D, or E? What was the question? Um, which one is your P wave? Um, uh, it's... It can be more than one. Okay, I'd probably say like E and D and C. Yeah, E and D for sure, yeah. right? Not C, because you know QRS and then you get to D, it goes in line with this, what would be a classic T. It goes in line with what would be a classic T here. Mm -hmm. So this is your P. This is your P. Something weird happens here, right? Your mm -hmm. T was supposed to look like this. Now it's looking like this. So let's ignore this for now. You see your P again. You see something here, which looks like a, like a delta wave, but you haven't seen that before. Then you get to P and then you get to P. So if you march out these circles, including this weird one, you'll see that the P waves mark or this thing marches out pretty regularly, right? Okay. At a rate of, I would say 300, 150, 100, almost like 80 or 70. So what's happening is you have a atrial rate of around 80s, pretty regularly marching out. Mm -hmm. These QRSs are regular at a rate of, I'm guessing maybe something like 30, 40, um, what are the three, yeah, five, three, six, five, at five. a rate of 30, right? Yeah. So you have an atrial rate of 80 something, mm -hmm. ventricular rate of 30. There seems to be no connection between them. A P falls on top of it, a P falls on top of the T, nothing changes. Mm -hmm. So you could say in, in a way, the P's are um, independent of the QRS and the atrial rate is faster than the ventricular rate. Okay, okay, I think I... I think, I think I missed the P falling the same as the QRS. Exactly, it, 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 is, it is a harder one. You know, it falls on the QRS, it falls on a T, it's kind of complicated. But just whenever this, this happens, your T's shouldn't change on, 
well, your taste shouldn't change anyway, right? So if it's changing, something's going on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right? So P and QRS independent of each other, atrial rate faster than the ventricular rate, that's going to be classic for complete heart block. Okay. Yep. All right. Um, share all my drawings. All right, so next thing we've talked about PR, we've talked about um, P waves, rate and rhythm. Let's talk about QRS, right? This is somewhere, this is something that's gonna be a bit complicated just because we don't talk about this enough. QRS durations are important because anything greater than 120 milliseconds, three small boxes is gonna mean bundle branch, bundle branch block, right? So this picture you see V6, one, two, three, probably three and a half, four. Pathognomonic for bundle branch block. Next, you've got to figure out whether it's right bundle and left bundle. There's easier ways of figuring this out, but for the purposes of education, we're gonna try and figure it out together why we see what we see. Um, as soon as I can get my annotation marker. Oh, there you go. All right, so, what happens is you have the electrical activity starting in the sinus node, goes to the AV node, goes to the his per kanji, then goes into the bundle branches. Um, in a normal conduction cycle, what's first gonna happen is you're gonna have a left ventricle to right ventricular depolarization, even in normal conduction with no bundle branch blocks, right? When electricity moves towards V1, you're gonna have a positive deflection in V1, you're gonna have a negative in V6. Let's take this orange line as the isoelectric. So positive in V1, negative in V6, right? What's gonna happen next is both of the ventricles are gonna depolarize at the same time because, um, the, because the left ventricle is bigger than the large ventricle, it has more myocardium, more electrical um, activity it's gonna depolarize more. So this red arrow going towards V6. So as you know, we were talking about V1 is gonna be parasternal, V6 is gonna be mid axillary line. Left and right, pretty much obvious, right? So left ventricle, the net electrical activity is gonna to be towards the left. Ventricle is bigger, pulls more electricity. You're gonna see that on the EKG. So it's going away from V1. You'll see a negative on V1, you'll see a positive, on V6. Because there's no bundle branch block, because this is happening simultaneously, you're gonna see it less than 120 milliseconds. 120 MS, right? That's reasonable, that's obvious. What happens in bundle branch blocks, right? Right bundle branch block, you've blocked the right bundle here, right? So you have a normal left, What's gonna happen when you have a bu blocked bundle, your depolarization is gonna go through the myocardium because electrical activity is closed for whatever reasons, we'll talk about that later. The first step, um, I label these steps A, B, C, same as the one in the previous slide. A is the normal one, which we initially see. B is going to be when, the, when both the ventricles depolarize. So first step remains the same, you know, left to right, the right is blocked, um, but your left is gonna be more dominant, pushing electrical activity towards the right. So what you see on V1 is a positive deflection. What you see on V6 is a negative deflection, right? Um, what happens next? This is uh, part B. This is the time where both the ventricles were supposed to depolarize at the same time. The problem is your bundled branch isn't working. So only the left one gets depolarized. So your V1, we had this, V6, we had this. What's happening now is V6 is gonna be more dominant. So you're gonna see a positive deflection on V6. V1, the depolarization is going away. So you're gonna see negative on V1. So this is where we're at right now. Now what's gonna happen is once the electrical activity goes to the, to the left, the right one hasn't depolarized yet. So myocardial cells are gonna carry that electricity from the left ventricle into the right ventricle. You're gonna see a delayed um, positive in V1. That's where the electricity is going. You're gonna see a delayed negative in V6. So you're gonna end up with this kind of a pattern, right? 
we'll come back to this. What's happening? Um, what's happening in left bundle branch lock, right? Pretty much the same concepts. You'll have this initial part A. It's not gonna be the same, right? Cause your left bundle branch block, uh, left bundle branch is blocked right here. You're not gonna get that activity that you were getting in part A previously. So you're gonna see a reverse. Um, the right ventricle is gonna be polarized before the left. So you'll see um, negative deflection on V1, positive deflection on V6. Um, at this point, this is part B, where both the ventricles depolarize together. That's not happening because your bundle branch isn't working. The ven um, right ventricle is gonna depolarize first. It's gonna pull electrical activity towards it. So what you'll see is negative, the one we got here, followed by a positive, reverse for V6, right? We had a positive initially, now it's gonna go negative. Pretty much the reverse concept here, myocardial cells from the, um, what you call it? This is gonna be a smaller deflection just because your right ventricle is a smaller unit to begin with, right? In the meantime, depolarization is gonna go from right to left through the myocardial cells. V6, larger unit, it's gonna pull electricity towards it. What you're gonna see is, this is what you already had we're gonna see it going away from V1. So we're gonna have this sort of a deflection. This is where we were at at V6. Going towards V6, you have a positive deflection. This is the reason why we're getting the deflections which we are getting. Right, that, I cleared them, but this is what we ended up on, right? This kind of a setting on left bundle branch lock, this kind of a setting on right bundle branch lock. You don't need to know everything that we talked about on the previous two slides. It's just to get an understanding of where, why we're getting where we're getting. Easier way to remember this is going to be William and Marrow, right? You look at V1, you look at V6, look at the morphology of the QRS. If it looks like a W and then it looks like an M, it's going to be left bundle branch block. You look at V1 QRS, if it looks like an M and V6 looks like a W, it's going to be right bundle branch block. Of course, the QRS duration has to be longer than the three small boxes. So that's gonna be a way to kind of diagnose bundle branch blocks, blo blocks once you look at uh, prolonged QRS. So let's try and practice that. Uh, before we go into that, one caveat, you know where we talked about the right ventricle is gonna be smaller, it's gonna cause a smaller um, deflection. You might not always see this W. Just a caveat. Anyway, um, next up is Enhua. We can skip you here. Let's skip you. Let's go to Majid. I don't know. I think Lucas could have answered this one. Seems like a simple one, right? Yeah. Um, the rate looks about 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 66. Um, I do not see a PVA for every QRS. At least the PVAs I'm looking at are not decent enough. So this is irregularly irregular. I have wide QRS. And from what I'm seeing, it looks like there's also a left bundle. Um, let me see. Or some very massive ST elevations. Um, with reciprocal depressions in 2, 3 ABF. Yeah, I'm going to call this a uh, lateral wall STEMI. Okay. Um, so let's go back. 66 sounds good. Re uh, rhythm is irregularly irregular. So that sounds good. It's AFib. QRS is prolonged. Um, you don't see any P, P, so we can't do obviously PRs. QRS is prolonged, so you know there's the bundle branch block right there. Um, what do you think about the morphology on the on V6? Uh, let me bring my trusty pen. What do you think is happening here? Maybe here as well. 
Um, so that's kind of the notch where the right ventricle is kind of trying to mm -hmm. um, depolarize. And then the right ventricle tries to depolarize. In the meantime, the left ventricle depolarizes. So you see that. So this is kind of, you could say, an M in this setting. Yeah. Same with this kind of a awkward kind of a change in shape here. It's kind of confusing because these are Q waves, right? But the QRS morphology on, sorry, V1, say it's something like this. So then it would become William, right? I think we talked about in the previous one. So that would be a left bundle branch block. Right. The S, right? The ST segments, we'll talk about this. So with bundle branch blocks, you're gonna have a uh, delayed depolarization, delayed changes in your QRS. So your QRS is gonna come in the way where you would normal, normally see an ST, right? Mm -hmm. We'll come to this, but normally what you, what, or what I do is you draw eyes on top of the ST and see what kind of face it makes. To be fair, it looks like a sad face, which is, which you can say, is pointing towards ischemia. But for the purposes of our practice, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll say, you know, left bundle branch block, we'll talk sure. about ischemia in a bit. So you would see the same changes in two, three, and I mean, reciprocal changes as well, the same like the no, three? No, you shouldn't see reciprocal changes in just bundle branch. So yeah. I get what you're saying. That's why I did this, this eyes thing. Yeah. And, you know, a happy face is gonna mean you can chill. A sad face, is going to mean it's probably malignant. Then you look at things like what you talked about, you know, these, um, these changes. Of course, with bundle branch blocks and ST elevations, you have other criteria that you're going to use to diagnose ischemia, but we're not going to go into that today. It's order to proponent. Hmm? It's order to okay. proponent. Order to proponent is called cardiology. Right. Um, this one. Who I think Reed, Reed hasn't. Uh, done one yet? Is he there? Yeah, oh, I'm here. Perfect. Um, <laughs> right. Okay. So it's it's normal. I think it's normal sinus Q wave in front of every QRS. Um, it's regular rate, regular rhythm. There's no ST elevations. Or is there? What's going on in AVR there? You tell me. Is this just a bundle branch block with V1, V2, and V3? That's all I'm seeing. Okay, so how would you go about kind of figuring out if it's a bundle, bra bundle branch block or not? Well, you would measure the width of the QRS first, okay. but it looks, okay. I didn't measure it, but it, <laughs> it looks wide. Yeah. yeah, it looks wide enough. Uh, and I, to be honest, I forget. Um, I know you mentioned it, but I forget what it was, the exact amount of blocks. Oh, um, anything longer than three is going to be three small boxes, 120 milliseconds. Okay. okay. It's kind of, so you've got. I, I think right? it's safe to say it's greater, but I can't really tell in the image. It is. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that would be a left bundle branch block, which is right. which is MI sense? until proven otherwise, right? Yeah, it's an MI equivalent, but it could be an old one. Um, but what makes you say it's um, left bundle? as opposed to right one. Uh, is, that, is that a trick question or am I getting something mixed up in my head? No, just no, I just want to know what your thought process is so we can talk about it, you know, kind of. Oh, just the, yeah. my, well, am I right? Cause I don't want to say anything. <laughs> 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 uh, just way the, the way the leads are placed on your chest, V1 through V3 will generally indicate a left-sided versus V4 to V6 will be right-sided. And I could be getting that backwards. Um, I mean, the, you mean the QRS on V1 to V3? 
Yeah, so a QRS, uh, if it were widened in V4, V5, V6, that would be indicative of the right funnel branch block. V1 through 3 is left funnel branch block. But notice how the QRS duration in V6 and V1 is pretty much similar, maybe a marginally longer. Oh. But what's our other hack? Right? Okay. Just yeah. go with letters. Go with William and Marrow. Go with um, okay. graphical kind of help. So let's go back to these two. What's the letter that you see in the QRS for each of them? I see an M and V1. Perfect. So you have an M. I see a V1. very uh, poor example of a W and V6. Exactly. So kind of. <laughs> right? Okay. Then you just fill in the blanks. You go with. Marrow. Some people use Morrow. It doesn't make sense. I go with Marrow. So <laughs> Marrow, right bundle branch, right? Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. So all this go for exactly. It's much easier than than they tell you. Much okay. easier when you're doing this rather than this. But yeah, just stick yeah. by this. Try to look for letters. Um, right bundle branch okay. is going to be more obvious with the M and Ws. Left bundle branch is going to be more discreet. Exactly what we saw with our two examples. Yeah. Okay. All right. So now we come to the, the fun part, ST segments. Um, are there any interns kind of hopping in now? We can go with, uh, I don't know, Nadine, I guess. I think Nadine did one. Let's have some. Oh, I, I, can't, I can't have this one. Oh, okay, yeah. I'll go over. Okay, so we can see P wave barely but still we can see, and uh, PR interval looks fine to me. Um, and also it is regular, QRS regular. And uh, because we are talking about the ST segment, segment specifically, we can see V1, 2, 3, uh, 4, yeah, of course, 5, and uh, not sure about six because I need a, a kind of six, but still there is, yeah. Yeah, maybe, uh, I think one millimeter, but yeah, 100%, you know, ST elevations, ST elevations. Let's mm -hmm. do the same practice that we did with Majid. Make eyes, make a face out of it. It's a sad face. You should be mm -hmm. worried. You need cat lab and all of that, right? Yeah. Um, and we're going to talk about, you know, the thing that you were mentioning with and, um, uh, and also yeah. left access deviation, if we want to know more, we can see, yeah, one lead and this way. <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah, I have a slide for it anyway. Who's gonna go for this next one? Maril. Okay, so this one, let me just get my computer real quick. Okay. So here we have a patient. Um, the rate would be approximately like 190 to 100, maybe um, regular, regular rhythm. Um, he has or she has um, diffu um, SD elevation in V1, I'm sorry, lead one, um, lead AVL, then diffuse, oops, sorry. Uh, in, and I can see some SD elevation in diffusely in the lateral leads, like V2, V3, V4, V5, V6. And some reciprocal changes, like some changes in like ST depression in lead three, ABF, and V2, uh, lead two. Yep, perfect. So looks like, what's the diagnosis, Nathan? So this would be, uh, L, um, what is it called? ABF, yeah. um, uh, circumflex or yeah, main? I mean I think could be second text could be main, but essentially anterolateral, right? And uh, yeah, anterolateral ischemia, yeah. Yeah. Um, 
the the point i brought this ekg up was i know these are reciprocal changes but to have an idea of what st depressions are going to look like um classic you have the isoelectric line all the way down um st depressions but sorry it work um so essentially this is what we're looking at um st and t wave morphologies anytime you have um a flat st elevation or a down sloping st elevation that's going to be a greater risk for ischemia that's going to be more worrying as opposed to um a kind of happy face the reason why you get this happy face and why we're not worried about it is it it can be repolarization abnormalities you know we were talking about um the ventricles depolarizing in the qrs sometimes they'll have repolarization abnormalities which will cause this kind of a weird morphology or a st elevation that's not really indicative of um ischemia um and this is the st elevation kind of a criteria for purposes like to make it simple greater than 1 mm any lead it should be worrying unless you're looking at the precordials v2 or v3 they can be kind of deceptive um which you can notice here v2 and v3 are kind of out of the place as opposed to these ones which are reasonably elevated so the criteria is going to be different st depressions um again the same thing it's if it's horizontal it's down sloping it's going to be worse up sloping it's still indicative of ischemia but there is an error rate here um depressions greater than 1 mm greater than 0.5 mm is diagnostic but you need it in two or more contiguous leads which means two or more that correspond to the same territory and and anterior lateral um inferior if it's greater than 1 mm of course as the depressions get worse they get worse st depressions greater than 2 mm have a 35% 30 day mortality that is pretty bad to put into context um i don't know what i'm trying to teach here so let's just go through okay i got it um who's next are you sure i guess yep um So talking about the rate, it's around three hundred divided by one, two, three, four, four boxes, which would be um, around seventy, seventy-five-ish. Um, rate is regular. P waves look good to me. There are P waves. Uh, QRS. I'm not sure if you're trying to. The morphology is quite weird uh, with the QRS. No, ignore that. It's just a bad image. <laughs> um, coming to T. Um, T waves inverted in the line, which look fine to me. I don't see anything weird in this. This looks okay. like a perfect sinus rhythm to me. So you did rate, you did rhythm, you did P wave morphologies. What about mm -hmm. intervals? Uh, PR. PR is maybe slightly. PR looks good. QRS is fine. ST looks okayish. So this looks normal, right? The PR. Yeah. Um. What other interval do we have? Oh, oh QT. Alrighty. Yep. So right? yep, mm -hmm. and is QT. If I measure, I generally do with the. Um, More than half half of the previous RR interval, so it is kind of prolonged. Exactly. So more than half of RR, you know, something's going wrong. Use MD calc to come up with the QTC. Um, it'll figure it out for you. Um, correct it by rate. Lead two is always going to be the best for QT intervals. When you see something like this, you know how the T isn't kind of a. Uh, where do we see? right like right here the t is kind of uniform goes up goes down but here you're seeing these um bumps 
anytime there's a bump, you can get confused. Okay, do I calculate the QT interval to be here or here? Unless the lead goes down to the isoelectric line, you keep on measuring it. So if it has like three other bumps, unless it reaches the isoelectric line, that's going to be your QT. So sometimes you'll see um, P, Q, R, S, you'll see a T wave that's going to be flat and then come down. This is going to be, or sorry, the isoelectric line, that's going to be your QT interval. So just make sure, and it can be more kind of subtle, but isoelectric line is where you end the QT, but yeah. So prolonged QT, um, why is it relevant? Because it's common. Um, and we play around with a lot of these medications, right? I'm sorry. So patients are going to come in on amiodarone long-term. They're going to come in with other antiarrhythmics, um, COPD exacerbation, come to the floor. We throw them clarithromycin. They, they're acting up over, uh, they have nausea. We do undensetron. Where is our acting up medication? Yeah. They're acting up overnight. You give them Haldol. We give them all of that. They were also taking sertraline because they had depression. Patient goes into this. Ahead. What's up? Uh, which, which lead do you use to calculate the QT? Uh, lead two. Lead two is going to be the best. Okay. And if lead two. You mentioned mid calc, and there are like multiple formulas like Perdricia, Bazet. Which one is uh, which one so should we use? Our EP uses Bazet. But they're also of the opinion that it doesn't matter. Most of them are going to be within 20 or 30 milliseconds of each other. But okay. Bazette is going to be. All right, thanks, man. Yep. Um, I think Bazette is the highest one. You will get, get the highest QT. That's why they use it, because it's, it's the safest in the end. Okay. So we threw on sertraline, Haldol, clarithromycin. Nurse, you're in the room, patient isn't moving, this isn't artifact. What's the diagnosis? Um, I think, wait, Al Shafi hasn't done one. If he's there. No, All right, Mahmoud, you were the last one to speak, you get to go. So I think this is, should be VTech. I think the, the thing that confused us is like, is this SVT with aberrancy or is this VTEC? So like there are some criteria that we look for like AV dissociation and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. I think this is VTEC, if I'm right. Yep, yeah. so um, how do you, so let's start from the start. Rate is tachycardic, okay. um, rhythm is, fairly regular as much as you can tell. Um, you don't see any P's, you don't see any T's, you don't see anything apart from QRSS, which is reasonable. I mean, if this was a better image, maybe if this was sinus tech, you, with aberrancy, you would see a P, something like this, but it's not. Um, so white and QRSS are white, right? So white complex tachycardia. Um, but look at the morphologies of the Q, right? So how do you classify VTAC? Um, monomorphic and polymorphic VTAC, right? Yeah. So polymorphic VTAC in the setting that we, you know, pushed in a bunch of um, QT prolonging, prolonging medications. And then look at the morphologies. They're different, but they're going in a certain kind of a trend. Or what do you think is happening here? It's just like for set, like, Exactly. Changing the exactly. set of Exactly. So it's going in more of a torsad's uh, kind of a picture. And that's what happens when your QT gets prolonged. You go into torsad, right? So patient comes in with this EKG. Um, QTC is probably going to be something like 560 or whatever. You throw in a bunch of medications, you go into this. Um, how do you treat it in the, in like, just for time purposes, I'll say it. If the patient doesn't have a pulse, you'll shock them. You'll defibrillate them. If the patient has a pulse and has low blood pressure, hypotension, he's um, hemodynamically unstable, you're going to synchronize cardioversion, right? If the patient has a pulse, if the patient is non-motensive, you're going to push. I mean, um, you're going to push magnesium four grams over thirty minutes. You're going to start them on a the magnesium drip. You're going to send them to the ICU. 
we're going to call EP. Yep. So medications wise, magnesium works. Otherwise, pulse, cardioversion, no pulse, defibrillation, torsades, hopefully or commonly is self um, terminating. But of course, sometimes it won't be. Good question. Right. Do we have a magnesium drip? Yes. I'm sure you'll have to go to the ICU for that because magnesium overdose causes respiratory depression and com coma and all of that. But we do have a drip, yeah. Hmm. Okay. It runs at something like 0.5 megs an hour, one meg an hour. Um, you monitor magnesium rates. You want it to be less than four or three. I could be wrong about that. So how, how long we need to like continue magnesium drip? Till the levels normalize. So anything less than three or four, I'm not exactly sure what the cutoff is. Um, and then you need to monitor them for 24 hours in the ICU. Sounds good. Thank you. And of course, you'll take away the QT prolonging medications. You'll make sure QT goes back to baseline. Take away the antiarrhythmics if you need to, because if you're given, take a cent to keep them out of it if they're not going to need it, if they're going into ventricular arrhythmias. Yep. So last thing, access, right? So Enno already brought this up first. For access, you're going to look at three things. V, uh, sorry, lead one, lead two, and AVF. Right? And what you're looking at is QRS and the QRS kind of uh, um, the balance. So you see how there's a little bit of negative here, a um, little bit of negative here. So what you essentially what you're doing is you're just playing with the, what the QRS looks like. Lead one, there's more of a positive deflection than negative, right? There's nothing negative. So what you do or what I do at least is I make, uh, I make a cross like this. Lead one is positive in this direction, so I, sh so I shade all of this. Okay. When I look at lead two, is it positive more or negative more? It's positive more. Lead two is always going to be in this direction. This is lead two. This is the perpendicular line, so I'm going to shade this part on my drawing board. So I'll shade this. This part I won't shade because lead one would have to be negative for this part to be true. right? And then um, da, 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 AFib, more positive, uh, sorry, AVF, more positive than negative. So you'll AVF is gonna go straight down. So perpendicular line, shade everything above it. You're gonna shade this part. These are not gonna be eligible because either one wasn't meeting the criteria or two wasn't meeting the criteria. So you're gonna end up in this segment. This is gonna be the net access of this patient. Anything from negative 30, Oops. Anything from negative 30 to positive 90 is going to be normal. Anything from negative 30 to negative 90 is going to be left axis deviation. Positive 90 to 180 is going to be right axis deviation. Makes sense, right? You have normal, which is in the direction which your normal current should be. If it goes towards the left, it's axis deviation to the left. If it goes towards the right, it's right axis. This is called severe axis deviation, could be left, could be right. Essentially, um, just real bad disease of either this or this, yeah. All right, differentials, left axis deviation, there's a bunch of stuff, it's busy, never mind. Left ventricular hypertrophy or right-sided MI or left bundle branch block, they're gonna cause left axis deviation, deviation. Most commonly, you're gonna see left axis with chronic hypertensives with ventricular hypertrophy. Same with right. Um, right ventricular hypertrophy, right bundle branch block. Anyone with pulmonary disease is gonna have an increased pulmonary pressures. Right ventricular is gonna become enlarged, you're gonna see right axis deviation. Take home message. Rate, rhythm, intervals, access, repeat. Don't skip steps. Don't look at an EKG and diagnose, you know, whatever. Go through the steps. I'm sure you'll see something that wasn't there at first. Questions?